Tickets. Tickets, please. Step inside, take a ride, upon the terror train. All aboard, be fair warned, these rails house fear and pain. Find a seat, don't mind the heat, just pray the lights stay on. Upon these rails, these bloody rails, in darkness lies no dawn. Yes, step inside, come crawl or glide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Take it, please. <laughs> James Ward Kirk Publications presents Terror Train Episode One twenty two California Welcome aboard. Welcome to my home. I am the distant bodied voice. Your ghost host, so to speak. Call me. Be you dead, undead, or of the living. Hell 
train。Take it, please. Roger Cowan. There's a hell train a coming, riding down on me. Made a deal with the devil. Now he's coming to collect my soul. There's a hell train a coming. I can hear its forbidding whistle wail. Feel the thunder of its wheels rattling those iron bones. There's a hell train a coming, and I do believe. That's old Scratch himself. I see, sitting high in the engineer's seat. There's a hell train a coming, sliding out of the darkness like a snake from its skin. Got no place to run. Got no place to hide. Better count your blessings. Better count your sins. Don't make no deals with no devils, or you'll wind up riding that hell train till eternity's end. Tasty. <laughs> Don't 
Don't you agree? <laughs> A bloody ticket is handed to our eager conductor, which reads, Lee. <laughs> Take it, please. Enter the Corruption by Lee M. Lane. Oh dear God, help me! When, if, I get out of this unscathed, I swear I'll do whatever it takes to stop them. I'll dedicate my life to the cause. I swear. My thoughts shift to the connecting door just ahead. The swarm slowly closes the gap between us. I can hear them trampling one another to reach me. Hold up, yells one. What are you running from, calls another. I hit the door, pausing just long enough to slide it open. Someone swipes at me, missing my back but catching a lock of my hair while I slip through. My head snaps back with a painful tug of my hair, but I sacrifice the lock, crying with the quick but painful rip from my scalp. I forced shut the door, but immediately they fight me to slide it back open. Help me, I scream, knowing I can only hold the door for another few seconds before their combined efforts force my failing muscles to give way. I glance behind me, noticing that I have entered the first of the business class cars. Its riders watch me with disinterest. One among the infected group gives the door a good yank, and I stagger in my attempt to keep the door shut. An arm shoots through the ensuing gap and reaches for me. Its manicured fingernails miss my face by a matter of millimeters. Another grabs hold of me by a pant leg. Please, someone help me with the door! I try again. A young man comes up behind me, his tone reflecting more annoyance than concern when he asks, What's going on? Something's infected them. It'll spread through the whole train if we don't find a way to stop them. He shoots me a look that tells me he thinks I'm off my rocker. Infected with what? My limbs shake against the ever-reinforcing fight against me, and they're able to get it open another inch. I stagger to keep my hold, but I'm quickly losing the battle. I don't know, I tell the man, but we have to keep them out. One of the horde attempts to wriggle through, forcing the door another inch with her thin frame. Unable to hold it closed any longer, I release my grip and take off through the aisle. I don't look back. The screams tell me all I need to know. I know the mob will be upon me again in only a moment, and I know their numbers will only increase with the short diversion. It takes only a minute for the infection to take over, and then they'll join the mob, stopping at nothing to add more minds 
to their network. I scurry into the next car, pausing only long enough to shut the door before sprinting to the next. They're coming. Run for your lives, I yell. Chaos ensues. Suddenly, everyone is in the aisle, and we're fighting for passage to the door ahead. Passengers shriek in fear of a threat they have yet to see for themselves. I find myself crushed in the panicked mass. I wonder what they think they're running from. An armed robber, perhaps. Or maybe a serial killer intent on slashing to death an entire bullet train of people. No doubt, they haven't a clue what threat actually lies beyond the door just behind us. Neither had I. A mere half hour ago, I'd been sitting in my economy class seat, watching the blurs of sound wall art and limited patches of open field and California poppies through the nearest window from my aisle seat. The man beside me, clean-shaven and dressed in business attire, had dozed off. I tried to sleep as well, hoping to stave off my own boredom. But my excitement over the family that awaited me at the other end of the line had kept me awake. Dear God, help me! I noticed the woman across the aisle was one of those nanotech implantees. Her posture far too stiff, and her movements too precise for her to be unaltered. She wore a starched white blouse, finely pressed slacks, and her hair twisted into a sleek, tight bun. She stared straight ahead, her eyes scanning an internet page only she could see. She showed a hint of amusement at whatever it was she read, before she turned to the five-year-old boy sitting beside her in the window seat. Go to your father's URL, she said, leaning in to the boy. He cocked his head, stared ahead for a moment, and then turned to her. What's so funny about that? The sound of his voice made me flinch. It was as though I watched a boy-sized android responding to his rich, stuffy owner. His face was devoid of emotion, and he sat upright and perfectly still. I'd never seen a second-generation tech head, but I had heard they were about as human as their parents were relative to us. They were the product of a scientific breakthrough, gone terribly wrong. A defilement of both mind and soul that had left the small elite few who had paid the five million dollars to undergo the procedure, altered in ways no one could have foreseen. While they retained some semblance of human emotion, their children were not so fortunate. No, they were something altogether different. Oh, dear God! He seemed to feel my eyes on him and turned mechanically to meet my surprised gaze. Staring me down, he asked, Mother, why is that drone watching us? I turned away as she shifted to glance over at me. Don't bother yourself with the drones. Finish your homework. I do not want to finish my homework, Mother. I want to know why it was staring at me, and why it looked away when it knew you were about to assess its behavior. What does it want? They stare at things sometimes, son. Finish your homework. Unacceptable response, said the boy. I felt the chill of a cold sweat soaking through my light cotton shirt as I fought the urge to explain myself. 
How does one describe horror and pity to a child devoid of all emotion? What possible words could convey to a person whose brain is nothing more than circuits and nanochips that his mere presence induced intense discomfort? To my surprise, the man sitting directly in front of the boy whipped around to face him and said in a stern, annoyed voice, She was staring at you because you're a freak. A scientific mistake. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to read my book in peace. The man returned to his seat with an exasperated huff. I watched the boy through the corner of my eye while he emitted a strange noise that was every bit as unnerving as his mechanical demeanor. Clearly, despite his inability to understand emotion, he was capable of taking offense. In a sudden but precise move, he dived forward and bit the man in his ear. Everyone within view stood, and immediately the car was filled with the chaotic din of surprise and revulsion. The man held his bleeding ear while he stumbled past the passenger beside him and into the aisle. He fell to his knees, crying out. Frozen in shock by the unexpected sight, no one moved to help him. Those closest to the boy, including me, rushed to gain some distance. I felt my heart skip a beat at the sight of the boy expressing something vaguely recognizable to a smile. Blood smudged over his lips and chin. His mother looked annoyed but did not reprimand him. The man went strangely silent for a moment, then went painfully stiff and dropped onto his back in a fit of convulsions. He stared at the ceiling, his face frozen in a look of terror. Again, he went still. He sucked in a deep breath, his expression going flat. Everyone gasped and watched in disbelief when the blood trickling from his ear went from red to silver. The boy seemed pleased by the effect and lunged at the next nearest person, then another, and another after that. Those who tried to strike down the boy suffered his mother's protective fury. The aisle became a traffic jam of hysterical bystanders. The man bleeding silver grabbed a passing leg and sank his teeth into the fleshy calf. I wasn't sure what exactly was happening, but I knew it wasn't good. I vaulted over several rows of seats and fought a handful of others to get through the door. Only a few people managed to escape behind me before a strong young man gave a forceful shove to the front of the crowd and shut the door. He, along with a few others, held it shut, while the rest of us continued to make our way toward the next car. Those seated around us stood and looked around, some asking for an explanation as to what threat, either assumed or established, fought to breach the closed door. None of us were able to provide an adequate response. Hell, I don't even think we knew what we were running from, only that we feared what might become of us should it get through. I didn't bother to explain myself, my only concern being to reach that next door, and then the one after that. By the time I reached the first class cars, only a couple of people ran with me. I didn't bother wondering what had become of those still behind us, and I didn't consider 
what I might do once I reached the front car. When I and my two companions went to move to the next car, however, the train's security guard stopped us. Is something the matter? asked the lanky uniformed man. The train needs to make an emergency stop, cried the young woman who had been running directly behind me. There's a problem with a tech head back in one of the economy cars. We tried to push forward, but the security guard held us back. You need to return to your seats. My other companion, a middle-aged man, vehemently shook his head. I'm not going back there. The security guard threatened us with all sorts of ridiculous charges, refusing to allow us to continue forward. Surrounding passengers began to get involved, helping him to restrain us for being so disruptive, and he managed to handcuff the middle-aged man after a forceful attempt at breaking past the human barrier. Suddenly, the door behind us slid open with a forceful shove, and a horde of men and women, all bleeding silver from bites on their arms or legs, rushed toward us. The security guard continued to try to keep order, and I alone managed to slip past him. So now, here I am. Whatever that child had started, it has spread at an alarming pace. I'm running out of cars, the horde right behind me. I dart into the next car, freezing when I realize I've reached my final retreat. I go dizzy at the sight through the observation windows that wrap from the sides to the front of the car. There are only a handful of people seated here, and they look surprised by my presence. I turn to the sound of the door opening behind me. The horde pours in. My heart racing, I make a dash for the open restroom. I scream when one of them seizes me by my wrist and tugs me from the doorway. What's your hurry? he asks while the last few unsuspecting passengers scream under attack. Trust me, it's all for the best. I yank back my arm while he sinks his teeth into it. I stumble back into the restroom and quickly lock myself in. My throat goes tight at the sight of the wound, knowing something terrible awaits me when I spot the bottle of hand sanitizer beside the basin. I slather the clear gel over my wound and rub it in, wincing with the sudden sting. The blood continues to run red, but I know that could change despite my efforts to kill whatever has infected the rest of the train. I ask myself, do I feel any different? nothing yet. My arm begins to itch like crazy, and I wonder if this is the first sign of dissemination. Unsure what else to do, I rub in another layer of hand sanitizer. I feel faint. Am I losing consciousness? Is this the end? What will become of me if the infection does take hold? I can't ignore the impulse to rake my fingernails across my forearm, the itching so intense that scratching it does not offer me any relief. My body jolts with a heavy bang against the door. What are you doing in there? someone asks. Come on out, says another, asks yet another. Why haven't you logged into the network? I continue to tear at my arm. The itching only intensifies, but my blood still runs red. God help me. 
someone attempts to kick in the door. A couple others join in on the endeavor. Leave me alone, I scream. I can feel the train slowing. Would the horde file out, leaving me only to infect everyone at the terminal? The door begins to cave. Will it stop in time? Do I want it to stop? I try to prepare myself to break past them, but I can't concentrate. I've scratched my arm raw, but to no end. The itching is unbearable. The train slows to a halt. The door hangs closed by a thread. I can't stop the itching. I feel as though my body is under siege. I can barely breathe. I hear the platform door open. I would feel a hint of relief if I could ease my discomfort, even just a little. My arm has grown red and bloody. Still red. The door caves with one final kick, and a few of the horde bleed in. There's nowhere left to run. I can't stop scratching. I can't concentrate. I can't breathe. A man bites my uninjured arm. I think to go for the hand sanitizer, but I can't bring myself to stop tearing at the agonizing itch. The horde files out, leaving me alone in my misery. The itch begins to abate, but I no longer feel any desire to reach for the hand sanitizer. I feel... What do I feel? I feel... Nothing. I see the internet unfold within my mind's eye, and I log in. I look down at my wound. Silver. Metallic. What was I doing in here? I exit the train and look at all the people who have yet to connect. Look at them scream. I stride toward the nearest one. Don't be afraid, I tell it. Feelings are so underrated. Connecting, that's what's important. Still, it screams. For the time we 
had a permanent guest as they tell their tales of horror at its best. Come, yeah, join me. My name is Terror, who rides the rail. Survived this trek? No turning back. Dare resist, just try. Step back inside, we'll be your guide. So many ways to die. Upon this ride, nowhere to hide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Terror Train Podcast, Episode 122, California. Produced by Krista Clark Grabowski, David Schutz II, and Mary Genevieve Fortier. Podcast directed and arranged by David Schutz II. The Conductor, Your Narrator, was created by and played by David Schutz II. Terror, The Disembodied Voice, was created by and played by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Terror Train Podcast Opening and Closing Poems, written by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Host Segment Dialogue for Terror, the Disembodied Voice, written by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Production Music The House of Leaves, Chase Pulse, The Hive, and The Voices, by Kevin McLeod, in Copadec.com. Featured Works Hell Train Written by Roger Cowan Production Music Echoes of Time, Version 2 By Kevin MacLeod, Incombatech.com Enter the Corruption Written by Lee M. Lane Production Music Devastation and Loss Aftermath Right Behind You Gloom Horizon Zombie Hoodoo Trepidation And One of Them by Kevin McLeod in Capitec.com. Additional sound effects by AudioSoundClips.com. Podcast program edited by David Schutz II. The stories and poems presented in the Terror Train podcasts are all featured in the James Ward Kirk Publishing Anthology, Terror Train, which was edited by Krista Clark Grabowski and A. Henry Keane. Cover art by Stephen Cooney. Content Copyright 2014 Terror Train Podcast Episode 122 California Copyright 2014